Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our uh, Sabbath School uh, presentation uh, this uh, morning. Uh, actually, we are going to begin a new uh, series of lessons uh, for this quarter, uh, quarter number four for the year. And so, uh, in essence, really, we are going to talk about the specific uh, for this morning is rebellion in a perfect universe. Rebellion in a perfect universe. Lesson number one for October 1, 2022. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to look at uh, some reflections on the whole uh, quarter uh, presentation uh, that we are going to deal with. And so after some reflection, I concluded that the organizing principle of the quarter's lesson was a great controversy theme. But with an overarching theme in mind, the lesson pursues themes like human nature, which is found in Seventh-day Adventist belief fundamentals number seven, and death and resurrection uh, fundamentals nine and 26. And there is also some focus on end time events, fund fundamental 25 and 28. So I would summarize the lesson theme as death and resurrection through the lens of a cosmic conflict approach. And the running context will be cosmic conflict, but the primary theme will be death and resurrection. So uh, that is uh, going to be our uh, discussion throughout this quarter. But for this morning, uh, we are going to deal with this particular subtopics uh, uh, in lesson number one, creation and expression of love. Uh, number two, free will, the basis for love. And then number four, three, mysterious ingratitude and the, the price of pride and then the spread of unbelief. And then if we have time, we are going to summarize our presentation today. So uh, in this lesson, history is riddled with great uprising against the tyranny of oppressors. People rebel against injustice. And of course, imagine a perfect government, perfect and fair laws, and freedom and welfare for everyone. Why would anyone want to rebel? Inexplicably, that happened when Lucifer rebelled in, against God in heaven. And so uh, this morning, we are going to look at reasons to be loyal. The love of God, and then the free will, and then, of course, uh, we are going to deal with reasons to rebel, uh, ingratitude, and then pride, and then uh, look at the uh, reasons to care. We are going to deal with uh, Revelation 12, uh, because uh, in, in, in essence, our discussion this morning, it, it, it touched a lot of uh, major uh, Adventist doctrine or Adventist belief. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, in one lesson it touches several, uh, you know, uh, topics about uh, an important uh, concept of uh, Adventism. And so, uh, uh, to begin with, here, here is our key text today. Uh, it says that uh, in Isaiah 14, 12, How have you fallen from heaven? Your star of mo the morning, sun of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, and you have defeated the nations. Isaiah fourteen twelve. So, uh, in the rebellion and perfect universe, in a perfect universe, according to this week's lesson, the theme of the first week study is this question: How did sin and evil appear? in a perfect world. We will pursue this question uh, in the rest of our study uh, uh, today. And so uh, uh, num part number one is that here are the uh, reasons to be loyal. Uh, Sunday creation and ex an expression of love. Nature in its present condition is, uh, you know, uh, offers a mix messages that mingles good and evil. And how does one explain the 
coexistence of good and evil in our world. One option, philosophically, suggests that evil exists to enhance our appreciation of good. Another is that evil is a disruption of perfection plan. Jesus seems to address this issue in Matthew 13, uh, 12, uh, 13 24 to 30. And according to him, uh, what is the origin of evil? And so this is the key text in Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Jesus was telling a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. When we talk about kingdom of heaven here, he's talking about actually the kingdom. Actually who he is. And uh, it says here, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came, sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads and from the weeds also appeared, the owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? And in verse 28 it said, an enemy did this. I highlighted this one. An enemy did this, he replied. The servant asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until harvest. At the time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now, this is uh, how it's interesting to note that the author used this text to represent uh, uh, the beginning of, uh, you know, uh, creation and expression of love in, in the why uh, rebellion in a perfect world. If you notice here, uh, uh, the, the, the parable of Jesus Christ an enemy did this, he replied. And so uh, it looks like, uh, uh, and then of course, uh, creation and expression of love. And then here is another text that we can see. Uh, 1 John 4, 7 to 8. What does this passage say about God? If everything God does is an expression of love, how do, you, how do the six types of wrath in the Bible fit an expression of love? It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And so, uh, in this uh, uh, subject here, in the creation and expression of love, of course we know that uh, God uh, loves everybody, including the sinners. When he showers uh, us with rain, includes everyone. And sometimes uh, we ask the question, uh, why God do that? Uh, because he is love. He loves everybody. And the problem, the question is that uh, sin alters our perception and sometimes hinders uh, God's love for, uh, you know, to express the result of that love. And so, you know, uh, in, in, in Jesus, uh, John uh, expresses that uh, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God. Whoever doesn't love does not know God. A, a very uh, uh, expression of uh, the, uh, the idea is that he, and then again, the love of God, and so we know and rely on the love of God has for us, for God is love. So, love must be shown first. God showed his love between three people that he is. Then his love moved him to create another being in order to share his love with them. And of course, uh, all the beings God has created have been given the ability to love and to love his love on others. And of course, uh, in, uh, besides love is the principle behind all the laws that God has established. Therefore, sin, rebellion against God's laws should never have existed 
and it couldn't have been created by God. But in Jesus' parable, because it says the devil did this, how did it happen in a perfect universe? You know, and so uh, have you ever watched uh, uh, a hummingbird? <coughs> uh, what do you think of a God who would make that little creature and those colors, you know, they are incredible. Once in a while when uh, uh, the bird built their nest in a window, you, we could see that the most marvelous things to watch and then those little eggs, I've always been fascinated by this. And the way the mother looks at them, of course, didn't like us not uh, uh, scrub Jay from home, steal the eggs or a cat would watch the bird. Well, that's also part of the sin. You know, sometimes uh, this beautiful scenery, here comes, you know, the perpetrator like a cat or other birds that snatch the egg. And But think of God, but think of a God who would create the hummingbird to come and get nectar from the bird of paradise. We had some, you know, in, in our backyard, absolutely marvelous that their color, their little blue part and then the next section, and then another blue part. Did you ever try to pull one of those open prematurely? They just don't get it right, do they? And yet when they are ready, the case opens just enough to let the next section out. And do you see God's engineering in that? Ah, it speaks marvelously about God. And the most wonderful thing he ever made on our planet is celebrated in you know, Song of Solomon, you know how religion tends to be uh, legalistic? So demanding it is not true that on this planet we have tended to think of people who withdraw, separate themselves, live lives of total self-denial and denial of everything that's really pleasant. That they are the truly spiritual folk. No, that's not the way God designed it. Why make heaven beautiful if, errant, if, if there are errant people who enjoy things that are beautiful? So in our mind, this, uh, in the Sunday's lesson, uh, the love of God is the basis uh, of creation. And so uh, uh, this beautiful creation started already in the Garden of Eden. Uh, we can see how beautiful it was because of God's love. Now, in our Monday's lesson, uh, free will, the basis for love. In, in, in 1 John, again, uh, chapter 4, verse 9 to 16, what do we learn about God's love from this passage? What kind of decision-making process can help avoid the negative consequences of choices we have made in the past? Does the creation of Lucifer make God ultimately responsible for the origin of sin. And so uh, uh, let's read the text here in John chapter 4, 9 to 16. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If you notice here, God's love precedes our love. He says, he loved at first and citizen. Dear friends, according to John, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So that God's love here is uh, a result of, uh, you know, a result in loving another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And this love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us the spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives them in them and in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God 
and God in them. Wow. And uh, I wonder tonight <clears throat> if we could think back of the imagination of the very dramatic events uh, in the first week of Earth's history. Uh, the war had begun already up in heaven. Uh, Satan had already leveled his charges and his accusation. One third of the angels had already agreed with him that God is not worthy of our love and our trusts. And yet, uh, right in the middle of that devastating, devastating crisis, God invites us family to watch him as he creates another world and this time ours. How easily he could have created our world with a snap of his finger in just instant of a time. But in the dramatic and significant setting, the great controversy, he chose, he chose this time to do it in six, four, uh, you know, six, uh, six 24 hours days. On the first day, all he had lit there be light, and that's all. And then two days, three days, four days, five days. As God is unheard majesty and drama unfolded his plans for our earth. By six day, what a beautiful place this was, where now where Satan charges that God is selfish. So when we talk about God is love, he loved us first. I mean, look at the freedom. He created us in his own image with the power to think and to do. And we know from human history that he created us free to either love and trust him or hate him and spit on his face. Because it, was, it has been done, you know. He created us able to do it. God even allowed Satan to approach our first parents in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He didn't hide that tree in some dark corner of the garden. He put it right in the middle near the tree of life so that Adam and Eve, and Eve would see it every time they come to that other tree. You know, free will is very important and freedom is very important to God. That's why free will is the basis of love. We cannot love truly if there is no free will. We have to choose. And so, you know, the question is, what do we learn out of God's love from this passage? And it says, what kind of decision making? And uh, because we have... We are free to love, respond to his love, or not to respond to his love. And so there is a, response, a consequence of choices we have made in the past. And so it says that uh, the, the free will, beloved God, so love us that we also ought to love one another. And so uh, God created in the whole universe as a perfect and harmonious environment for his creatures to grow in love and in wisdom. In addition to the ability to love, all creatures from angels to humankind have been given something inherent to love. Freedom. Nobody is forced to love. Nobody is forced to love. And freedom came with a risk. However, someone might choose not to love. And we cannot understand why it happened. But it happened. This is how sin appeared in the universe. And right there in the Garden of Eden, when God told Adam and Eve, you know, do this and do that, and they, they, they have the freedom to choose not to follow him. And of course, the consequence is that uh, we are affected by this choice. So although sin is contrary to God's nature, he allowed its existence an expensive price the life of his son, an expression of love, free will. So here, uh, another section of our lesson is there is reasons to rebel. You know, uh, we need to go back to the origin because Revelation 12 in our last subject becomes so meaningful when we study it on the basis of the creation story. And why there was that sin. And so, uh, but before we go in there, uh, here are uh, some texts from the Bible 
the mysterious ingratitude, and it says in our Tuesday's lesson, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19, what can we learn from this passage about the mysterious origin of sin? You know, uh, in, uh, let's uh, read the text here, uh, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. No, Isaiah uses uh, the king of Tyre uh, in expression to communicate what happened. You were in the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your sittings and mountings were made of gold, and the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a garden cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walk among the fire, fiery forest stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. If you notice this, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness found in you. Through the widespread trade, you were filled with violence. You sinned, so I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and they expel you to the uh, Sagardian syrup from among the fair stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings, and by your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you, and I reduced you to the ashes and to the ground, the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to the horrible end and will be no more. Wow. Uh, if you notice this in this text, I, Ezekiel describes the origin until the end uh, of him no more. Now, a crucial statement. In the whole account is found in Ezekiel 28:15, which says, You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Hence, uh, Lucifer's perfection included the potential for evil, the potential to do wrong because of the freedom. And that was because of a moral being. Lucifer possessed free will part of what means what it means to be a part of perfect being because you cannot be perfect until you have freedom in reality lucifer was created perfect which included an ability to choose freely however abusing that perfection by the misuse of his free will he became corrupted by considering himself more important than actually was no longer satisfied with how God created and honored him, Lucifer lost his thankfulness to God and wished to receive more recognition than he actually deserved. How could this happen with a perfect angelic being in a perfect universe is, as already mentioned, a mystery because it is a mysterious ingratitude. So, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, text uh, today is that you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. It's a mystery. We cannot explain why. But it, it happened because of the free will. God explained to Ezekiel how rebellion began in Lucifer's heart by using the king of Tyre as an example and, of course, uh, it says he was created by perfect and beautiful. He was put in a high-ranking positions, verse 14. And, of course, iniquity was found in him, in him, so he had to be expelled from heaven. 
verse 15 to 16. And uh, he became vain because of his beauty and wanted to be worshipped instead of God. 17 to 18. In gratitude. And so uh, that is really the idea in which uh, the beginning on the perfect universe, he was no longer thankful to God for having created him. He thought he was more important than he actually was. He used his free will to rebel against his creator. So, in our Wednesday's lesson, another angle, the price of pride. Uh, in Isaiah 14, 12, to 25. It says, what does this passage tell us about God and about Lucifer? And so let's read the text here. Isaiah 12, uh, 14, 12 to 15. It says, how ha, you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the enthroned and the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of mounts of Saphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realms of the dead and to the depths of the pet. You know, the Bible in essence, really, uses uh, you know, uh, the idea of mourning stands the power of direct exposition to God and his kingdom. And see, fallen from heaven, he's using uh, uh, here uh, the imagery of Babylon and the king Babylon with a, a special allusion to Nebuchadnezzar becomes a symbol of pride and arrogance. When God uh, revealed to him a dream of uh, the future kingdoms of the nations, gold, silver, brass, iron, and mixture of iron. Uh, he, built an, uh, he built an image of pure gold because of pride. And so here, we can, God revealed to the king of Nebuchadnezzar that Babylon was only gold head of the great image, successive empires, and challenging God's revelation, the king, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, revealed that Babylon was only gold head of a great image. And so challenging God's revelation, the king made an image entirely of gold. A symbol that his kingdom would last forever and even required everyone to worship it. Found in Daniel chapter 3. As in the case of the king of Tyre, in Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19, uh, the king of Babylon also became a symbol of Lucifer. So, you know, this is one of the important aspects that we need to look at pride and also ingratitude, ingratitude and pride. This is, you, you, uh, uh, Lucifer said to himself here, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He is now aiming to be God. You know, Isaiah introduces another reason why Lucifer rebelled against God, pride. Pride is very, very, uh, you know. Uh, Isaiah used the king of Babylon as an example. Two Babylonian kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, were punished for their pride. And Lucifer needed his own worshippers to fulfill his goals in order to get them he accused God of being what Lucifer actually was, selfish, arrogant, and liar. And so this is the mysterious, this is the mysterious origin of evil in the universe. He, did, he was not created, you know, like this, but he became proud. He became ungrateful. So the reasons, the reasons to care. Do we care? You know, do we care about this, what's going on? You know, very important question because uh, uh, it can answer a lot of questions why in the perfect universe there is sin, there is rebellion. If it is perfect, 
universe, how come there is rebellion? And we need to look at uh, uh, the reasons to care because it's a very important aspect in our discussion this morning. And we will discuss this throughout the quarter. Uh, the idea of why and the reasons. Uh, of course, uh, it says here that uh, the spread of unbelief. Because when Lucifer, you know, became proud and ungrateful, he also spread. He also spread lies, spread untruth. He, uh, uh, in our case this time, uh, you know, uh, uh, fake news using social media. <laughs> There are a lot of people who are misguided because of this. But no, it was not you. It was right there in heaven. It was started in heaven. He, he uses all the schemes of the shit uh, that uh, he can use in order to, you know, to gain. Uh, but let's look at uh, Revelation 12. Tell us about cosmic conflict. In what ways is the battle continuing in our world today? So let's read the text because this is kind of long. Uh, it's uh, the whole chapter, I think uh, 17 verses. But it's very important for us to look at it uh, in, in, in the whole picture. It says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant cried out in pain, and she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars of the sky and flung them to the earth. It's referring to one third of the angels in heaven. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give the birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon, who was Lucifer, now Satan, was hurled down the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who led the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him, one third with angels. And then, verse 10, then I heard a voice in heaven saying, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of the Messiah for the accuser of the brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. They felt they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had been given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half time, out of the serpent's bridge. Then from there, from his mouth and a serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged 
at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep the commandments, God's command, and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. Wow. If you notice, Revelation 12 expands uh, uh, the creation story and the temptation of Adam and Eve right here. When we ask a question, when Adam and Eve was tempted in the Garden of Eden by the serpent, which is Satan here in, according to Revelation 12, there was already an existence of sin before Adam and Eve's temptation. Existence of sin and essence. What I mean is that Satan had already uh, waged war against God. He rebelled against him because of pride and ingratitude. So that means to say that Adam's uh, giving in to the sin because Satan already used one-third of the angels, convinced one-third of the angels, and now he is applying the deceitfulness temptations to Adam and Eve. So therefore, we can see here that let us consider again what had gone wrong here. Because I believe the way we understand what went wrong helps us understand the method God has used to set things right. And particularly, it helps us to understand why Jesus said has to die. Our God has been accused specifically of being arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, and forgiving, and severe. God sent his son to reveal truth about these matters because Jesus said, he who has sent me has sent the Father. And why was it not enough for Jesus to come and live among us if he, if he did and tell us the truth about God and then demonstrate by his gracious treatment of the worst sinners that God, indeed it is not the kind of person his enemies have made him out to be. Of course, the way he lived and the way he treated people is vital evidence. And we will spend much time on it later on in our discussion this quarter, particularly, you know, how God treats the erring God's children. But remember, and the most serious charge level against God, our God, is that God had lied to us. He reverted, he used his own attitude as God's attitude. He said, God is a liar. That's why when he tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, he asked Eve, I said, did God really tell you this, not to do this? He is accusing now God as not telling the truth. When God told Adam and Eve that the minute or the moment you touch and eat the fruit, you are going to die. Satan questioned and told Adam and Eve that God is not telling the truth because he said you are not going to die. Right there in the challenge in the Garden of Eden, you know. And, you know, uh, we, he pictures God as uh, either you obey, you know, and then, and then uh, if you don't, yeah, that's okay. And uh, I think of a baleful epic that perversion of the truth about God had has on the human race. Think how he has poisoned people's attitude towards God in practice of religion. Think of picturing our gracious God as saying, you either love me or obey me. And, and obey me or if you don't love me, then I'll kill you. That's what he did in the garden. Satan said to, to Adam and Eve, you see, God is saying now that, you know, if you love God, you have to obey him. You don't have to obey him because according to Satan, you are not going to die. And that's a lie, right? That's a lie. How could this satanic view of God win such wide acceptance as it has? And it is still very widely believed. You know, thousands of years, men have sacrificed even their own children to win the favor of their offended gods. Even in the Christian world, it is suggested, even believed, that if 
it were not for Christ's appeasement, sometimes called propitiation, or his father's wrath, he would belong now to have been destroyed. And were it not for Christ, constant pleading with the Father, God could not find it in her own house to forgive and heal his children. No, that's not the way it is. Who could have thought of such perversion? But now, as you know, in 66 books, the whole Bible, does anything need to be done to persuade God to love his children? The testimony of uh, the whole Bible, 66 books, love even his most wayward children. That is what is some in John 3.16. It says, for God so loved the world, not just his good children, but all his children, both and bad, good and bad. And so, you know, that is very important for us to realize uh, that Satan presented a wrong picture of unbelief, false doctrine, you know, lies, fake news. <laughs> and so, as we see it today. So the great controversy that we have today is that woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the seed for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Revelation 12, 12. You know, should we care about what happened in heaven thousands of years ago? Of course we care. Because uh, Revelation explains the idea that Satan rebels, uh, uh, the poor bear Lucifer, symbolized by the dragon, sweep a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. You know, uh, the controversy in heaven spread throughout the earth. Satan repeatedly attacked people of God, symbolized by the woman in Revelation 12, 1, to avoid the coming of Archangel Michael, Jesus, to earth. He tried to kill Jesus, the baby Jesus. We discussed this last week in our uh, last uh, topic of the last quarter's topic about the death of Jesus Christ. When Mary was, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesus was just a baby. He used Herod uh, to kill all children, including Jesus Christ. And, and they had to be a refugee to Egypt, you know, and this is one of the bases in which Satan is trying to destroy Michael, the archangel, so that there would be no Messiah to come. And, of course, we know the end of the story, that God is always, uh, you know, in control. And Jesus got the victory. Satan was defeated by his death and resurrection. However, the war has not finished yet. You know, it's ongoing. Although he is defeated, and yet he is still, you know, punching. Uh, when it comes to boxing, uh, the, the, you know, the fight is over, and yet he is still going on punching and puncher here and there. You know, and so... Uh, very important for us to realize that uh, in the view of the great controversy, this is why uh, we are suffering because of that. So here is a uh, slide from Desire of Ages, uh, chapter 1, page 22. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan. Notice that, from the beginning. And the fall of man through the deceptive power of apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he covenanted to give his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In our uh, uh, Thursday's lesson, uh, there is a notation there from uh, Alison says that Satan was given multiple opportunities to come back, but he has reached a point of no return because of pride and because of ungratefulness. And so, uh, you know, uh, to, to summarize our discussion this morning, uh, rebellion in a perfect universe, all that God does is an expression of his unconditional 
an unchangeable love. That the questions that we have here about the sixth wrath in the Bible is that, you know, uh, when uh, uh, God expresses his love and we reject that, we reap the consequence of our choices because when we got, when God uh, gave us over uh, and he is not in control of our lives, Satan takes over. He makes us miserable. And so God, an expression of his unconditional, unchangeable love, he does this even for a sinner, even for a good people, for bad people. And yet, you know, the reaction is different. Because when John 3.16 said, for God so loved the world, that includes everybody. It doesn't only choose the good ones and, you know, including the bad ones. And God created the whole universe as a perfect and harmonious environment for his creatures to grow in love and in wisdom. And that perfect environment was, uh, you know, including the free will to choose, the power to choose. And so uh, there was no reasons for sense existing to sex. Uh, uh, there was no reason for sense existence to seek to explain it, to seek to give a reason for it. And that would be to justify it. You know, Ellen White said that uh, to explain the existence of the beginning of sin is to justify it. There is no reason. It is a mystery. And so several times uh, in the Bible, God called his people out of pagan Babylon to serve him in the promised land. And of course, uh, here is our last uh, slide. A major war in Revelation 12 broke out in heaven between Lucifer and his angels on one side, uh, on one side and Christ on his angels on the other side. And so uh, the idea of uh, uh, Lucifer becoming Satan, you know, convince one third of the heavenly angels to follow him was a very cunning, you know, deceptions that it applies also to Adam and Eve here in the Garden of Eden. And it affected all of us. It affected all of us. And so it's going on now. Major war that had started in heaven, broke up in heaven. It's going on. We are now a participants, sometimes a victim or you know, a contributor to that controversy. So uh, that is our lesson for this uh, uh, morning. And I hope that as uh, so we think again, uh, this is a foundation, a very under, a important foundation, our discussion for the whole quarter. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for our lesson today. It's kind of difficult. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, cannot explain it, and yet uh, by the word that you have given us, you give us insight of why it happened, why it started. And may the Lord, that as uh, we think it through, we will realize that it is important for us to care, to care about this issue because it affects everybody. It affects us, it affects our neighbors, our families, everybody, even in the church and the whole world. And thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us that insight that we may be able to have more faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.